Hey there guys, welcome to today's video. I apologize for the delay. Um, so this is a video about running the Sunless Citadel. Um, when I ran this adventure a little while back, I had uh, a few issues myself regarding mapping. I also found that with any kind of really big dungeon like this, you tend to find some rooms and encounters are way better than others. So I want to go over what encounters I think are sort of lacking in some story narrative and could use a bit of a reflavoring, and also um, any tips and tricks that I found whilst running this adventure. So hopefully you guys can sit back, relax and enjoy, and this will give you a nice big overview of what the adventure is, why your players are going there, so you can just begin to run this adventure straight out of the box without needing to read the entire adventure first. I do recommend that you read the entire adventure, uh, because it's going to be able to explain things far better than I am. However, hopefully this is able to summarise a lot of it for you. And uh, I know that I find that pretty helpful, so hopefully it uh, works for you guys as well. First things first, this adventure can be found in the Yawning Portal, Tales from the Yawning Portal that is. Um, it's the first adventure that you find inside there, and it's a fantastic little adventure um, for just starting new DMs off, or for starting new players off. Um, a great little Christmas gift if you're still looking to get somebody something. Um, the adventure synopsis kind of sums up a lot of what's going on. The adventure takes place in four stages. One is Oakhurst, and that is the starting town that's introduced in this adventure. When it comes to mapping Oakhurst uh, and finding a location for it, there's some information depending on what your um, setting is. I personally run my games in the Forgotten Realms, and as a result, it's very near Thunder Tree that you might remember from the um, the starter box, starter set, um, Lost Minds of Fandelva. Um, going on to the second stage, we have the Cobalt Den. Uh, now, the Cobalt Den is a pretty interesting little place. It's uh, it's basically where the kobolds and the goblins are sort of competing for territory. So there's a, an interesting sort of role-playing dynamic there. And finally, you have the Hidden Grove, where the story's climax sort of reaches its conclusion. So I'm going to go over each of these four parts and uh, address my thoughts on each one. First things first, guys, Oakhurst. Oakhurst is a pretty boring town. This right here, from here down to here, is all the information you get. Um, you do have some adventure hooks, but I tended, I found that uh, sort of making my own adventure hook worked a lot better. Um, it's it's full of just minimal detail here. The only thing I really found any use for was the uh, the old boring, um, but I just found this town to be lacking. So the first thing I recommend, flesh out this town. You don't want this town to be just a passing sort of you know, a passing trait. You want the players to care about this town. And maybe introducing new players to this town, um, you know, as a, a place where they can sort of relax, as a respite for them, that might be a really good way of uh, going forward. So flesh out this town. I recommend giving some characters some names, come up with some NPCs, different personalities, and maybe one of them goes missing all of a sudden. And that is when you discover the Citadel. Now the Citadel, I found this map to be incredibly confusing when I first started off. So you actually, it's kind of like a crate has kind of opened up in the ground, like a crack. And when you first descend down, you enter onto this ledge. This ledge then comes down these carved stone steps into the entrance of the Sunless Citadel. So this is where you start off your players. Now I recommend this entire section up here to be done through Theatre of the Mind. Uh, you can get a few um, checks to make sure nobody falls. Um, you know, there's a few sort of investigation checks that you have going on here. I believe there are some giant rats or some, you know, uh, rat swarms um, sort of lurking in a stone pile on this ledge. However, all of this works really well theatre of the mind. And I think you can run this as is. Uh, just go in down through the crumbling courtyard, which is here. The issue is when you get to this tiny map right here. Now this isn't a big map for the DM. This is also a pain in the ass because you can't photocopy this map to give to the players because uh, it has a lot of the trap locations on it. So I'm pretty sure you can find a map online of this or you can draw it out bit by bit. However I find that tends to take a little bit too long for my liking. You can use dungeon tiles 
However, what I definitely recommend with this map and the future maps is that you have some sort of uh, actual grid that your players can use. Because uh, trying to describe a map that is this complicated with this many different features, even trying to describe a circle or room with several doors coming off it, can be a bit of a nightmare, So um, especially for new DMs. So that is my first recommendation. So this is the first really interesting part of the dungeon. And that is the uh, this bottom layer right here. So what's interesting is that it's actually sort of locked off here by this secret entrance. And afterwards, you actually get to, and I'm not kidding here when I say that this works really well, um, a failed dragon priest. So if anyone's played Skyrim, this works really well as a good little introduction. And what the game recommends is that you use troll statistics, um, but you just lower the hit points. And the, uh, you lower the regeneration to make it a bit easier. Um, I think that works pretty well. Uh, it's your call, depending on what sort of what level your characters are going into this dungeon. If they've done an adventure first to sort of introduce them, or if this is the first game you're running with them. Um, but either way, this is the first really interesting sort of uh, situation here. Now, I think this is this provides a, a fantastic moment of role playing. Now, they obviously are going to meet this dragon priest, and if they have any knowledge of games like Skyrim. They're not going to want to fight it because they'll. It's a good opportunity to use your description to make this dragon priest seem way more powerful than it actually is. What I recommend is that you have the dragon priest say that if they're able to bring the dragon priest, sort of the soul of a dragon or something, uh, then he is going to be able to sort of rise to uh, a greater power and he will bestow some of that power on the player characters. That's what I actually ended up doing. Uh, one of the times that I've run this dungeon, is that there's a white dragon, only a young white dragon, in this uh, in this dungeon, that the goblins have actually kidnapped off of the kobolds, and that dragon's name is Calcrix, and uh, you get asked basically you can help you know get that dragon back. What I recommend is that you offer the players this opportunity if they discover this secret location, to um, actually bring the dragon not back to the kobolds but to the dragon priest and as a result they'll get some sort of power and what i recommend there is they get the ability to um to breathe fire like the dragonborn does so no matter what race they are they can have that a bit that racial trait and that's a really cool gift for being able to help the dragon priest there and uh, sort of make a little bit of an alliance otherwise they have a you know a pretty decent fight on their hands that's one way of really spicing up this little adventure one of the most interesting things about this adventure is that there's actually some sort of gang warfare going on between the kobolds and the goblins. Now I think definitely this adventure is sort of leaning towards you helping little Meepo here um, and helping the kobolds to get back their dragon. And of course I've already suggested that you instead offer an alternative, which is that they help the dragon priest get the soul of this dragon. But um, either way... Whatever you decide to do, it's an interesting sort of dynamic going on because your players can exploit the situation, uh, forcing the kobolds and the goblins to fight a little bit more and as a result reduce the amount of combat that they have to go through. They can try and join one side or another. What I definitely recommend though is there's a lot of rooms in here that are just very basic. Like, you know, hey, in this room there's three kobolds, kill them, there's nothing else there. There's nothing really of interest going on. Um, so what I recommend is that you condense the amount of rooms that there are. No players like to go from room to room, and in every single room that they go into, there's a combat that they cannot avoid. So reduce the amount of rooms that they're going into. Increase that level of roleplay. Have them pick a side in this fight. Do they want to help the kobolds? Do they want to help the goblins? Do they want to manipulate one side or the other? What do they want to do? Get that sort of, uh, allow them that opportunity and that's going to be really interesting. One of the most interesting rooms going on is uh, in number 37, there is the uh, captured dragon Calcrix. And uh, my recommendation with Calcrix, guys, is he actually prefers to be, he's been taken from the kobolds 
in this sort of goblin kobold fight um, because the kobolds were worshipping him and he's been captured by the goblins but he prefers to be with the goblins so when the players come to collect him possibly with Meepo trying to back them up this little tiny goblin who's uh, sorry kobold who's incredibly useless um, they are in a situation where Calcrix turns around to them and goes, well, actually, I'm happy where I am, and I don't really like the kobolds. That'll be, that's a really funny, sort of interesting kind of dynamic, and definitely stands out. All of a sudden, they've gone through this entire dungeon, killing goblins and fighting against these these goblinoid creatures, in order to get to uh, this white dragon to save him, who turns around and goes, well, actually, I don't want to be saved. That's an interesting one. That poses an interesting dynamic for the players to sort of uh, fight through. Another interesting thing that you'll find is kind of... Uh, basically, this section belongs to the kobolds, and this section belongs to the goblins. So, to descend into the deeper levels of the uh, this dungeon, they're going to have to fight through the goblins, meaning that at some point or another, regardless of what their interactions are with the goblins... The game kind of forces them into this position where they have to fight against the goblin leaders. Again, I recommend maybe helping, offering sort of role play situations here to help the goblins out as opposed to fighting them. You notice how many rooms there are here as well. There are so many little tiny rooms that have really nothing of interest in them. They're so boring to go through. I got bored DMing it. And a lot of the players got bored going through it. So what I did was I looked through the adventure. I found the most impressive, the funniest, the most entertaining sort of um, rooms and situations that I could. And I I took those and I just stuck those together. As opposed to having them go through all of these rooms trying to work out what's going on. This You've got to remember guys, this adventure was made at a time in D&D history when, you know, dungeon delving... That was the adventure, whereas I think it's lent more now to role play. So increase that role play element of it because it comes in a lot with more recent adventures. For a good example, look at Dragon Heist, right? Dragon Heist doesn't have giant dungeons like this, it has role play situations. So have more role play situations in this, reduce the amount of rooms. Pick and choose the rooms that you want, and then simplify this map for yourself. I promise you will not regret it. So in my opinion, guys, whatever happens with the goblins, the kobolds, and the dragon priest, all of that is kind of a distraction. And that's why I recommend cutting out bits of it. Okay? Because at the end of the day, like... That's not the main reason that you're going into this dungeon. Like, none of the villagers care about in Oakhurst care about you coming down here to rescue a dragon for the kobolds or to, you know, kill all the goblins. That's not an issue. So I recommend sort of simplifying that section. But the adventure really starts when you get to the grove level. And the grove level is super interesting. So... What that is, is basically there's a um, a Galthias tree, which is just here on the map. And a Galthias tree is created when a um, vampire who is staked through the heart, that stake begins to grow and it produces two kinds of fruit. One, uh, sort of like a red apple, and that's going to like heal people. And the second is a, um, is a sort of bluish, colder coloured apple. And that's going to damage them. What the Galthias tree also does is it produces blights to protect itself. And these blights, uh, a type of creature, they are basically... They're being sent up by this evil druid. Um, who is essentially going to like try and repopulate Oakhurst with these blights. So one really good encounter and one way of like introducing your players to this adventure is to have them run into like a you know a horde of like five blights and have to fight them and then they try and find out where these blights have come from that's a really good way of getting your players into this dungeon so um what i like about this is that the usual your typical stereotypical sort of uh, adventure is 
The players go into a dungeon, they fight an evil necromancer, it's always a necromancer, and they leave. In this one, it brings on a new sort of uh, new perspective. They go into the dungeon, there's an interesting sort of dynamic, there's some sort of uh, a mishap, they have to fight through some goblins and some kobolds. Um, there's multiple ways they can get through those scenarios. However, they then have to come and fight and finish off this evil druid. Now, some of the hooks suggest that you've actually come here to rescue some individuals. I recommend giving them a read and seeing if you prefer any of those. But um, I think coming down and just killing the druid is a pretty good way of sort of going through it yourselves. One thing that I think that this entire second level, this grove level of the dungeon is missing, is a giant spider. Now, that sounds really silly, but a giant spider is a fantastic first level enemy. Uh, and the reason being is because, one, you can uh, bind a lot of your players, uh, you can introduce poison as a mechanic in there. Um, they provide a lot of fun experiences, and of course, all the players know what a giant spider is, and as a result, you can hint that one is coming up. It, it becomes a very tense moment when they, they enter a room full of cobwebs. They'll never look at a cobweb-filled room again. It's a really fun experience. So that's my first introduction there, is whatever you make of this second part of this adventure, try and introduce a giant spider in there, because that encounter at early levels of the game is really fun for all players. I was saying earlier that... Um, one of the possible quests is that the players are asked to go into the Sunless Citadel to rescue uh, two individuals. One and two. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, uh, what is this, Sharwin? Yeah, I, you get the idea. They're complicated, typical fantasy names. Um, and the way that that's worked is basically the Galthias tree um, has created thralls out of these adventurers. Now, what's also really interesting is that these adventurers didn't come into the Sunless Citadel alone. They came with a, I believe he's a gnome, um, by the name of Erky Timbers. Um, and Erky's a, a really interesting sort of character, um, because he's been captured by, I believe, the goblins. So you can have this sort of uh, interesting hook. And when I ran this adventure, I had one of my... Uh, party get a note from Erky Timbers asking him, um, you know, saying that they were uh, old friends and asking him if he wouldn't mind coming on an adventure with him and that he'd be paid handsomely for his skill. And then when they arrived in Oakhurst, Erky Timbers had already left to the Sunless Citadel uh, and so they, the group were playing catch up to uh, help find Erky before everything was too late. But, uh, when you descend into the the depths of this uh, this giant cavern, again, you have a lot of different rooms that I do recommend simplifying. But the most interesting thing, in, in my opinion, to do is to um, get your players as quickly as possible to the Galthias tree, because this is such an interesting combat. The Galthias tree has a, a, it says here about the fruit, uh, the tree's thralls, which these adventurers have sadly turned into. Uh, there's also some fan a fantastic magical weapon in here as well. And you get the brilliant opportunity of having them fight against twig blights, some NPCs, and an evil druid. Like, that is such a fun, memorable combat. So my recommendation for this is to really ramp up this fight, right? Um, make this fight something memorable. Make them play tactfully um the gothias tree wants to defend itself at all costs and the druid wants to defend himself at all costs so this should be a fight that they cannot negotiate out of they've descended into the depth of the sunless citadel now they've had the opportunity to uh to save the the young white dragon calcrix um they possibly have some npc adventurers helping them out um you know Erky Timbers or Meepo or however you want to run it. Maybe they have a few uh, a few kobolds helping them out. But either way, this should be a fight that they remember, and this should be a tough fight. Um, it's a lot of uh, a lot of fun. And one really easy way of uh, making this fight a little bit more memorable or a little bit more uh, difficult or uh, interesting is to focus on the villain Belak. 
uh, you know, he's an outcast. So maybe when you expand Oakhurst as a setting for the adventurers, make Belak, uh, you know, mention Belak. Maybe mention to some of the spellcasters that they better not try any funny business because the, you know, members of Oakhurst, the people living there, have already, you know, basically shunned Belak um, for, you know, using magic irresponsibly. And they're going to do it again if any of the NPCs or any of the PCs go using magic irresponsibly. Uh, kind of try and create this sort of uh, feel for the character before you introduce him. That's one of the things that I didn't do and I wish I'd done. Is when the adventurers were in Oakhurst. And when you're really expanding that area of the adventure. Um, try to mention that there was once a, a druid by the name of Belak. Who was basically sent away. He was sort of... Um, he was recently outcast from the village. Uh, because of his uh, experimentations with plants. So that is that would be a really interesting way of sort of tying the adventure together uh, in a neat little bow. Uh, so I recommend kind of, uh, kind of experimenting with that. So all in all, guys, The Sun of the Citadel is a fantastic um, opening adventure for new DMs and for new players. Uh, my biggest criticisms with the adventure is that it doesn't expand upon the opening town neanly enough. And uh, it's kind of left to new DMs to sort of work that out for themselves. What I also highly recommend is that you guys simplify the dungeon for yourselves. There's a lot of rooms in here that are very vague, very boring. There's nothing really going on in them. And it takes up time. So unless you really want to recreate this sort of old school D&D... Um, exploring every single room and you know maybe you have five or six sessions exploring every single room in this dungeon then I recommend simplifying it I had two sessions to run this adventure and as a result I had to simplify this room for my players to sort of stop them getting bored stop them getting sidetracked and not enjoying themselves so that's something I do recommend uh, it takes a little bit of work, it, you know, I have I think I've gone over a lot of the major sort of plot points in this and I've talked about how you can expand certain areas and make them more interesting or, you know, discussing Calcrix. But as soon as you do that, you find that a lot of this dungeon turns into, you get rid of a lot of the sort of uh, minor rooms and you're left with just the, the bigger ones where the real big events are happening. So that's my recommendation for you guys. Uh, hopefully this has helped to some degree. Sun Citadel is a fantastic adventure. I'm hoping to do something like this for a few other little adventures. Um, maybe I'll go over some in a bit more detail. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed. Thank you for watching.